dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. <laughs> None other than Aita Sado. Good evening, everyone. What a wonderful day today is, isn't it? And when it rained, we thought about the first Martin's Day, right? And it snowed, and it snowed. And the TVSB buses were later than they usually are. <laughs> and Harbor Front looked really pretty because we were all there. And Sandra Whiten did an incredible job organizing and working with Charles. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful day. And even those people who were late in performance, other performance, um, rose to the occasion. And it was a wonderful thing. So tonight I'm very happy that on the 15th of January, you are also here. Really, really cool. And I want to say that last year in 2016, every day I would do a morning ritual. I would walk Bathurst Street because we knew at the time that we had to move and we needed a space. And so every morning I would come to Bathurst Street and walk all the way north to DuPont looking for a building, looking for a space, looking for that infrastructure that Charles Roach talked about, that Hugo Extavor talked about, and we all desirous of on Bathurst Street. And an interesting would happen in those walks. I would see a man, sometimes he would be on a bicycle, and sometimes he'd be walking. 
One of the great things about him was his consistency in wearing 1,000 earrings, <laughs> plaid, polka dot, and everything else in between. And this man would say to me, what are you doing? Because he never, ever once talked softly. What are you doing? And I would say the same thing almost every time. I'm walking back the street to see if there's a building or a place that we could have infrastructure and blah, 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 blah. Why are you doing that for? <laughs> oh, because, you know, we need to find a spot. You don't find your walking spot? No, it's only a six, seven minute walk, and I'm trying to figure out how to explain to the community that they would walk three seconds before from the subway to a different book list, but now they're going to walk to a destination of six and seven minutes. Well, you mad or what? Who walk in that? <laughs> Find another thing to do. And every morning I walked the street, Hugh, as he was coming from his Tai Chi class, right? There you go, right? And I was actually going to join him in Tai Chi. Not little did I know that a brother was going to come like two weeks later and say, I want to teach Tai Chi here, right? Forget this. So every day, every day, every day, morning, we would have this kind of ritual. And then one morning, I'm walking now Bloor Street. Movement has changed, walking Bloor Street. And as I walk past the dollar store, the dollar store dollarama, way in the buck, I don't know if he smelled me, if he spot me, if he had like something on a watch that went beep, 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 she passed in, no. He came running out of the dollar store. <laughs> And again, in that soft, loud voice, he said, You don't read the pink signs? Ah, uh, the pink signs. The pink signs across the street. Now, the pink signs were up across the street for about three years, and it said two words, for lease. For lease. And he obviously had read the pink signs a lot, for lease. <laughs> I remember one day he came into the store, and the place was packed with people, and he said to me, Excuse me? You want to talk to the people at the roti shop? And I'm thinking, why now be your advocate? I went there Monday and I said to them, all you have alo pie? They say, not today. I went there Tuesday and I said, the alo pie read? And they said, not today. I went back again Wednesday and I said, what happening with the alo pie? And they said, not today. <laughs> I went Thursday and I said, alo pie ready? And they said, I want you to go over there and tell them, check down the damn sign, there ain't no aloe pie. <laughs> Fifteen people in the shop look at this man and think, who the hell is that? What's he talking about? So I went next door and I said to the roadie shop, you need to take down the sign. You have no aloe pie. And a man in the roadie shop said, I have been telling them that, take down the sign. So it is really Hugh Extrovert that got the roadie shop to take down the sign. We have aloe pie. <laughs> so back to the dollar store now. So he ran out and he said to me, you read it's pink sign. For lease, for lease, for lease. And so I came and I said to Miguel, we sell books when we're in the business of words. We need to read the pink sign for lease. And so having read the pink sign for lease, we engaged with the developer and this is how we ended up here. So he was very much part of the reason that we are in this space because we read the pink signs, right? There you go. And then when we moved, he missed the move. I wasn't quite sure if he, why he missed the move if he didn't want to haul the boxes, but I noted that he came about 6 o'clock in the evening when the academics came, who never once lifted a box, but came to deconstruct the movement of the boxes across the street. And we were all thinking that, but Hugh and Hugh's um, good form, walking into the store, and he said to the academics, Olya, you look kind of fresh. I bet you didn't move one thing today. See, he, he knew the academics. They were deconstructing. And about a couple of months later, when we were settled in, I'm having a meeting with a number of book reps, and in cue came plaid, polka dot, flowered, one million earrings. And I'm sitting talking to about six people, and Hugh walks in and he says, Hinnaman. And I could see the other people thinking, oh my God, is he on the, the meeting? Like, what point is he speaking to? What's happening here? Hinnaman. Now you reach here, but you need to get back over there. And the people are thinking like, what part of the meeting is here? What is he speaking to? Who is this man? Does he not have, is he aware that we are here? Why is he just talking to Ita? And then he goes, so here now, to get back over there. 
You have to go and get now Hindu people, Jewish people, Christian people, Buddhist people, everybody that can pray. Have them do one big multicultural prayer and you're going to land back over there. The people in the meeting look at the notes again and think, where is he on the agenda? Why is he not speaking to us? They were having a black priest book for moment, like we were dismissed and like nobody's talking to us, you know? It was one of those kind of moments. And in true style, and as he was going through the door, and he always did this wonderful moment, he went through the door, and then he would have that pregnant pause, and he opened back up the door again, and he said his reoccurring line, stay black, oh my God. <laughs> People look at the agenda again. <laughs> So I am very pleased <laughs> that the Ectivore family is here. I am very pleased that we can be here to celebrate him and Charles, two great brothers that brought us Martin's Day. I just came from the Jane community um, with an initiative called the Walk with Excellence. And I'm going to say this real quickly. And one day going over the intersection of Jane and Finch, thinking about how do you impact narrative in a community. And as I'm going over the intersection, I see in my mind's eye, Charles and Dudley leading a parade. And they looked at me and they say, demonstration of public good. We are going with that. And that is how the Walk of Excellence got started because two of our leaders and our elders told us that when we publicly demonstrate, then things happen and we can impact change. So today, January 15th, is a wonderful occasion. Really happy that you came out to feel the vibes. Yes, I know it's snowing, but after all, it's Canada. Here we go, here we go. And what is also particularly cool is that I feel the next generation, too, is in the house. We got Sunset Roach coming up to make big, powerful points in a PowerPoint. You know what I'm saying? This is good. Next generation coming. And we have Erica coming up, too, and her family and her sisters. Really happy to see everybody to come also, too. So the next generation is in the house. Clap that up. Love it for that. And to you, Miss Extivore, love you off, love you off, love you off. Really, really, really happy. So now I'm going to call on Erica um, to come and to say a few words and to share. It's an open mic thing. We have a little something, something from both uh, daughters, uh, Sunset and Erica. And then we're going to do a little break uh, with Pam and Pat. And then it's going to be your turn to tell us how you member in the remembering. All right, Erica. Well, um, give thanks. Give thanks for life. Give thanks for the life giver. Acknowledge the almighty creator in this space today and with all of us. And we give thanks for the wonderful energy that brought all of us here today. Of course, we, we are here walking in the footsteps of our ancestors, standing on the shoulders of our ancestors. We want to honor my father, a father, um, Hugo Exavor, we want to honor, honor Charles Roach. Um, I remember Mr. Roach and his family like they're members of our family. I remember having family barbecues and, uh, you know, a lot of shared experiences, and that meant a lot to us because we definitely knew that our parents were revolutionary and living on the edge in a way, and it felt really good to be supported by another family, a Trinidadian family as well, so we give thanks for the Roach family and enough respect. And we want to uh, also just honor uh, our brother Marcus and his family, his wife Janine, and uh, my two nieces, Vivian and Simone Extivore. They're in a hot place right now, but they're definitely acknowledging the moment. So they're here with us spiritually. Um, my sister Cassandra is here. Kara is here. Maria, uh, another sister, she's on her way. So we just give thanks to everybody. Uh, we made a really beautiful Itel corn soup tonight, Trinidad style, so please enjoy. And um, what can we say? Well, we believe in each one, teach one, you know, so maybe meet somebody tonight that you've never met before. And congr we want to congratulate the different book lists and all the partners along the way. Um, and also, I know that we wanted to make a special mention tonight of Third World Bookstore. 
That was a bookstore that many of us grew up with. It was just up the street on Bathurst. The Johnsons were um, definitely role models and pioneers in, in many of our lives. So we honor them and we acknowledge them tonight too. Um, enjoy, please express yourself. We brought some great artifacts from the house. We have uh, those posters and the buttons, please take one. Um, learn, pass it on, and just give thanks. Give thanks for all the strength in making this happen. And um, yes, that's it, just give thanks. Very nice, and uh, thank you, Erica, and also to thank you, um, Kathy Grant, too, for bringing the clip-ins and all the people who brought clip-ins and music and other things that we are going to experience. And now, big moment. <laughs> she's not looking at me at all. You know, she's looking every which way. One thing I love about Sunset is uh, her excitement about things. And uh, some years ago, and this is all the Roach sisters, this is Dawn, Sunset, and Kike, they met me, and they gave me this pin, the Nakambuko pin from their father, or part of their family's history. And I placed it in one of my very expensive tops of $5.45, and um, wherever I would go in the, the community or the city at meetings, people would say, what a lovely button. And I would say, I'm so honored that the Rhodes Sisters presented me with this button, and I wear it with pride. A couple of months later, I met them at another occasion, and I'm wearing, again, a very expensive top of 1095. And they said to me, we would like to present you with another button. And I thought I was so special that maybe the only three buttons that Charles left in the world, they were just slowly giving them to me. And so they once again pinned it on my top, and wherever I went, my story would then be greater. Oh, my God, Charles actually left this in his will for me. I would say to people it was the last thing he held in his hand. You know, like the story was getting bigger because I was so honored that the sisters not only gave me the button, but they would pin it on my expensive 1295 outfit. And so Sunset, in all of her joy, came to the store one day and she said, I did number 2005 to raise money. And I thought, I'm feeling that. And she said to me, I know what I'm going to do. And Sunset went in her car and she came back with a box. And out of that box, she took 500 buttons. The buttons that I thought were only three in this world. The buttons that I was putting on my silk talks and telling everybody in a meeting, I am wearing history. But Sunset came with 500 buttons. It was an awkward moment to explain to her that I had already had three, and I didn't need another 497 because I didn't have that many outfits. And when I whispered into her ear a sweet nothing like, girl, I got you. I think I got 10 of these buttons already. <laughs> she resisted the notion to sell me a button. But Sunset, I love the fact that you're going to bring the buttons. I love that energy that you come with. And I love the fact that when I said to you, would you speak tonight unhesitatingly, there was a pregnant moment on the phone, but unhesitatingly, you said yes. Let's welcome Sunset Roach. Got no money in my pocket. Nothing in my locket. Got no meat, nothing to eat, but I got human rights. Well, I can't find employment, and that causes some annoyment. Got no job, no money in my fob, but I got human rights. Human rights, human rights, I got plenty human rights. Human rights, human rights, I got loads of human rights. Well, the police, the courts, and the army, and multi-corporations to defend me, because they got the might to do what's right to defend my human rights. And if you're black, brown, or yellow, you're equal to Rockefeller. Because before the law, it's equal score. We all got human rights. 
Human rights, human rights. We got plenty human rights. Well, go to sleep, my little baby. See you in the morning, maybe. I got no jelly for your hungry belly. But we got human rights. Human rights, human rights. We got plenty human rights. Thank you, Penman Pat. That was wonderful to hear Dad's voice again. And I want to say good evening to all of you. Good evening. And I want to make a special thank you to Aitha. She's saying that um, she asked me to speak, and uh, I didn't hesitate. I was thinking, why is she asking me to speak? Because I'm not a speaker. My dad was a speaker. My sister, TK, is a speaker. John is an actor, a speaker. I am an elementary school teacher of grade one, two, and three. <laughs> and I, I, I don't take to public speaking. However, because she was asking to speak on Martin's Day, I thought this is really important. This is more than me. This is not about me. This is about a person who inspired the world around civil rights. And I was speaking with this brother, I think you're Donovan. He was one of the first people to come. And I said, you know, what brought you out? And he, he was asking, are we going to be discussing? Are we going to have um, discussion? I said, well, you know what? I'm not really sure. It's where we want to take it. But Charles Roach as Hugo Exdiver were people about a movement, a movement that came before us. And when the United States, when Coretta Scott King had this movement to get the day in the United States. It's a holiday there. Um, we thought, they thought, hey, maybe we should get this as a holiday here in Toronto, in Canada. And I remember um, calling on the phone, um, speaking to Harbor Front, which was one of the first places where we observed that holiday, um, saying we want to move for this holiday. They're like, Martin Luther King wasn't Canadian. Why would we have a holiday for him? Well, it's a, and, and Dad used to say, well, Jesus Christ was not a Canadian. <laughs> um, Terry Fox, who is a Canadian, is celebrated around the world. That kind of thinking of country, they moved beyond that. They're looking at human beings and the impact that they had on the upliftment of people. And those three themes of anti-poverty that Martin Luther King focused on, anti-racism that he focused on, and peace, anti-war. Those three cardinal things were things that I observed, our family observed as we were growing up in the community. We're here at the residence of the people. I'm so glad that a different book list cultural center is continuing and building on the shoulders as we've heard that we build on to move forward because institutions last a long time. I mean, we get inspired to go out and demonstrate and do those things. They are important. But having an anchor that helps us sustain that is really important. I was just looking online, and if you go to the King Center online, they've got um, their institution down in Atlanta, and a, a number of us went down there in 1988, I think it was. Um, Hugo Exdiver was one of the people. Stan G. Grizel. How many people remember Stan G. Grizel? Yep. He was down there. He is a Canadian who was a leader of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car, Port Sleeping Car Porters, yes, right, 
in, for a number of years. You can look him up online. And he was part of a movement there. A. Philip Randall in the United States, too, was part of union organizing and those kinds of things, part of movement building. So um, we went down to the King Center um, for a summer workshop. And uh, I was speaking with my Aunt Margaret, who is not braving these climates, these, these, these elements today, so she didn't come today. But last night she gave me this. Um, it's from 1988. It's from the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change. And it is six principles of nonviolence. They're talking about nonviolence 365 days of the year, not just today. And it's good to have a focused day that gets our mind around it, but we know it goes beyond just a day. And you want to hear what the six principles are? Okay. I, I'm not going to give you the detail, but principle number one is nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. You know, Dawn reminded me, my sister, today that um, the symbols of the fight for equality are sometimes used by right-wing politicians who grab some of the truth and twist it so that even somebody like Martin Luther King, who lived and shared a tremendous philosophy for equality, at, at some points has been co-opted by, I mean, I didn't see it myself, but number 45, the 45th president was on TV signing something, uh, speaking the words of equality and justice, but we know the actions are exactly the opposite. So I want to encourage everyone to go back to reading some of Martin Luther King's words. We're here at a bookstore. I'm sure they sell King's works. You should patronize it. If you don't buy it here, buy it somewhere. But that first principle, nonviolence, is a way of life for courageous people. Uh, it's resisting evil. It's aggressive spiritually, mentally, emotionally. And it persuades opponents of the righteousness of our cause for justice and equality. Principle number two, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. Friendship and understanding. I mean, that's something that I use or try to every day. You know, when you're just having dealings with individuals, um, winning friendship and understanding um, in the creation of the beloved community. That's the end game, the beloved community. Principle number three, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. That's, that's, that's really a, an interesting one. You know, when we see things coming out of people that we really don't like, it's hard not to dislike the person, but it's really the behavior, because there's always hope that they might see the light. And even in ourselves, there may be things that we dislike, but we always are striving towards not defeating ourselves or putting ourselves down, but talking ourselves and others into positivity. Principle number four, nonviolence holds that suffering can educate and transform. Suffering can educate and transform. So those people who go out and demonstrate today, like the Black Lives Matter people, who are out in the cold for weeks, in front of the police station, and uh, other individuals criticizing, oh, you know, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. This, this is the kind of thing that Martin Luther King and the movement, it's not just him, people like Rosa Parks, um, 
in Canada here, even before all of that, with Viola Desmond, people um, <coughs> striving there to bring about equality. Yeah, so the, what I'm, the point is suffering brings attention. You know, when demonstrations go out and people, lot, including black people, are like, yeah, well, you know, well, this is not the time, this is not the way, you know, it's nonviolent, it's peaceful, it's educating, and it's transforming. So, principle number five nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. Uh, Nonviolence resists violence of spirit as well as the body. Nonviolent love is spontaneous, unmotivated, unselfish, and creative. Nonviolent love gives willingly, knowing that the return might be hostility. You've got to be really courageous in facing some of those things that the people in the 60s in the United States had to face. And people throughout the world have their own versions of fighting um, hate, but choosing love instead of hate. The final principle is nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. I think Barack Obama spoke about that, as did King, the bending, the arc of justice it may be long, but it bends towards freedom. And nonviolent resistor has deep faith that justice will eventually win. Nonviolence believes that God is a God of justice. So that kind of spirituality, which was a rock upon which Martin Luther King Jr. and others moved facing harsh criticism, is something that I think we can learn from. What can we do today? I mean, many of us today are doing things that may be continuing that legacy. Um, I hope we can open up the forum and hear about some of the things that you might be involved in or might be aware of. But uh, it was really, really quite impactful going down to the King Center. And now that since Ita asked me to do this, I'm not, I haven't done the PowerPoint business and all of that <laughs> stuff, but um, it's inspired me to look into maybe visiting the King Center again and seeing right now Bernice um, King. She is the CEO there. And um, we are in a new era, but many of the issues are similar. And I, I, I just, in closing, I wanted to mention, I was speaking with Doris, and I was saying one thing that I appreciated about my father was the positivity in our home. Even though outside he would be dealing with issues around po police brutality, discrimination, um, war, and all of these things, in our home, as in the Exeter home, there was a lot of music, a lot of art, a lot of these things that uplift, and it's wonderful. We have Pan and Pat here. We're hearing music, songs. Um, this woman, uh, Anne, where is Anne? Oh, Anne's right here. <laughs> she was mentioning, she was listening to some music of um, about Martin Luther King and um, one that I really like is um, Nina Simone. Uh, she's got a piece about um, what's going to happen now that the king of love is dead. Um, but we can draw from all these things, and a place like a different book list cultural center is really a jewel in our community. A jewel in our community because... It not only deals with the, electro, uh, the intellectual book knowledge, but it's also about art, photography, um, music, and all of these things working together 
to uplift the human spirit and share in equality. And I want to say we should give them a big hand and support them in as many ways as we can. out because two great sisters too um, are in the frames and this is Hetty Roach, um, Charles' partner in life and uh, mother of Sunset and Dawn and TK and this is the Roms protest and uh, also two great, <laughs> right, I love it, Fiber and there you go, and this is Manifa at Harborfront you know, fixing up to ask a very hard question. So, <laughs> so there are two with the ancestors, and we are here recognizing brothers, but I also, too, wanted to bring out the sisters, too, who have walked and marched and participated and did all those great things. So here you go. now is to the open mic part. All right. I know everybody got like, you know, their six page essays. No, 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 no. You know I'm playing, right? And <laughs> what are we going to do? You want to say something? I like this. Communication. No, because I'm looking at the audience and we have a lot of women here. Like most of the audience is women. Which is great. We want to see the men here too. However, the 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 reason I think that people like Hugo Exiver, Charles Roach, Martin Luther King Jr. could do the great things that they did is because they had solid partners and families who could sustain them through tough times. And Doris is here, and I want to give That's her right. a great hand. That's true. That's true. How important that is. Really great. Oh, that's great. Good. Very good. Um, good point, Sunset. And you notice how that little chant thing started there just now. Different booklets. That's the spirit of your family, you know, as a Trinidadian thing. Bom, 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 bom. So we're going to get the open mic um, segment going. Pam and Pat, I'm going to ask you to come up and share a few words as musician and as someone who played with both Charles and Hugo. And then by a show of hands, we will call on you and we will ask you to come up and remember. Yes, come on back. Sunset, um, Sunset said she's not given to public speaking. Do you believe her? No. <laughs> Probably wrote that speech over and over and over until she got it right, but she did get it right. I'm pleased to be here today. I, I've been friends with Charles and, and X, as we call you, um, for a very long time. As a matter of fact, about 51 years ago, when I was only four days in Toronto, I encountered Charles Roach. I lived somewhere in, in the University of Toronto area, and four days I walked to Young Street and then south on Young Street, and I'm going past. Dundas going south, and I pulled my brakes. I heard the sound of a pan. I'm in Canada in the 60s. I didn't even bring a pan with me. I didn't see one. And I heard a pan on Young Street, and I just stood still. I'm going to hear it again. And this is like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I followed that song up third floor in a building that's on the east side of the Eaton Center. The Eaton Center was not there. And um, that was called the Little Trinidad Club. 
uh, owned and operated by Charles Roach on the side. He was working for City Hall at the time as a lawyer. And a year later, that's when they started Carabana. Charles was the first uh, chair of Carabana. And that's um, a long time ago. So in that club, I ended up playing. On the Saturday, I started playing music. I was only here five or six days. And I started playing um, with the steel band there, with Joe Brown and so on. And um, sometimes Charlie would bring the guitar and he would sing. And he would take gigs on the side. So I started as a gigging musician playing the bass for Charlie. He'd be playing the guitar and singing. And a guy played the mandolin, a guy from Guyana. I think Sil was his name. No, not Selogom, Sil. Sil, um, maybe another, a similar name. But um, Selo played at the club back then, of course. And Selo was just um, recognized by FMC recently at their awards in October. Um, he was given the Pioneer Award. And so on. Um, Charlie would bring Sparrow back then and um, Kitchener to the Roy, not Roy Thompson Hall, uh, the one on King Street. King Eddie Hotel, and the one with the ghost, <laughs> and so on, and so on. And then uh, years later, I became a police officer, I think about, about two years later, in 1968, and I'd be working in this area. By then, Charlie got out of City Hall, and he's got a long office. He's starting his own practice at Bloor and Brunswick, not far from here. So I'd be walking the block, and sometimes to keep warm in the winter, you pop in there, you know. I didn't know the first time I went there. I was so happy to um, let him know I was a police officer and he saw me in uniform and stuff. And um, I didn't know I scared him. Because he took me in the back to his office, you know, and I said, I want to show you something. I've got a gun. <laughs> <laughs> I showed him the gun, but years later he, he reminded me about that. But I, I, did, I did the right thing, you know. You go in the back and you, you take the bullets, you put it in your pocket, and I showed him the gun. <laughs> And then I loaded it and put it back in. So that's one nice little story. I had another time. <laughs> another time he um, called on me to play somewhere impromptu at the last minute. I said, but I didn't rehearse. He said, don't give me that. You've been practicing all your life. <laughs> and I'm very much like talking to you here today. I didn't rehearse. <laughs> um, another thing, Charles um, almost invented protesting for equal rights in Toronto, right? Do you know this one time, his three daughters picketed in front of his house on Selby Street. They were young teenagers. Remember that sunset? No. Yeah, you guys did. They made picket something. Don, you remember? Yeah. You remember? For the baby bonus. Yeah, I think he was going to cut you guys off, right? Or he wasn't giving you a baby bonus. And the three of them made picket signs and they were going up and down Selby Street in front of his home. I just happened to draw up and say, wow. <laughs> yeah, you forgot about that, eh? Yeah. <laughs> and um, what else I was going to say? Um, there are so many stories. Um, I was going to get married. Oh, after I left the police force. I went back to that office on Brunswick and Bloor, and I said, um, Charlie, I want to open a business. He said, what kind of business? I said, roti shop. I did eventually open a roti shop. It was on Bloor, on Vaughan Road. For four years, I had a roti shop called the Roti Man, and then I became the Pan Man. <laughs> but um, so he said, you're going to open a roti shop? You got time for that? Why don't you come and work for me? I say, yeah, doing what? <laughs> he said, you're an ex-police officer. I'm a lawyer. We can find things to do, you know. And he made me his uh, private investigator. I stayed almost 10 years. Because he gave me the, the chance to be a musician. You see, you see, when you play that instrument, that's more important than working for me. So anytime you get a job to go, you go and play it and come back and make up your time. So sometime on Saturday mornings, I'll go and put in two or three hours for the time I took off. I'd start off the day by going to Old City Hall and uh, put, doing an adjournment or some sort of little thing there in the court, you know, that investigators would do. And, um, and then I could go downstairs in City Hall and change my clothes, put on a Caribbean shirt, take off my steel drum and go somewhere and do a gig with Dick Smith. 
And that was fun because he gave me that, that freedom. And I think I was able to develop my gigging skills and my musical ability that way. Um, I think I've covered a whole lot of... Um, oh, I was going to get married. And your mother said, why don't you get married in our home? So I got married in Charles Roach's home. And later on, I became his best man. Uh, we had a really good relationship, and um, I'm so happy to share some of the memories with you, and thank you very much. secrets no <laughs> all right you know all your secrets all right who else is next i want to while you're thinking who is next want to acknowledge to sankara leach our community taxi uh owen takes us all over the place he's driven every revolutionary in the city and it's really good so really wanted to acknowledge him all right yeah huh yeah, including me. That's right. <laughs> including me. <laughs> but it's good. So who's up next? Don't let everybody talk at the same time. I got to pick on people. All right. Phil Taylor's in the house. Oh, Phil Taylor is in the house. Um, Phil Taylor is right here. Another great friend of Charles. A great friend, too, of our community. Great ally. Phil, would you like to come up and share a few words? Love for you to do that. And Phil is on CIUT 89.5 FM every Monday and Friday also. All right. There you go. Thank you very much. I just left CIUT, and my last words were, please come and see this event and attend. So you all showed up just because you heard from me. I I'm very pleased with that. I, I understood we had a lot of power. Uh, I love Charles Roach and Hattie Roach. Uh, and I'm just so glad to be here. And particularly since the tie-in is, uh, of course, Martin Luther King. And Charles had so many of the qualities that people think they see and do see in Martin Luther King. He was, and Hetty. I got to keep saying Charles and Hetty because to me, it was a team and that I, I've been at their house when they're cooking, and there, it was not one person, it was always two people. It was like watching a dance. One is moving here to pick up something, the other is moving. And that was intellectually, they were the same way. And they were both so brave and serene. And, you know, Martin Luther King did this thing of advocating a human equal environment and an ending to the hatred and the violence that the violence necessary violence for people who love inequality and like to have and have who are motivated by greed they have to hate somebody and they always have to have violence and turbulence and martin luther king challenged them challenged that way of looking at the world and of course his reward was violence because if you offer a simple solution, an unthreatening one, you expose the one who doesn't believe it or must not believe it or they lose everything. And he became, as George Jackson said, and it was quoted on our show today, a marked man. Uh, but because of the beauty of his spirit, the clarity of his thought, he was a brilliant man, Martin Luther King, more brilliant than I ever realized. The more I look into him, the deeper it gets. It's like you look into, you say, oh, that's deep. And then you say, oh, no, it's deeper than I thought. Um, we talked about today the fact that Martin Luther King studied Hegel for one year. You can read his notes, thank goodness, probably through historians and others. You can actually look at his notes. And if, if, to take on Hegel and to comprehend him, is a, a great achievement intellectually. But the, the hook in the story, as the storytellers say, is that Hegel was inspired by the Haitian Revolution because he said it proved the slaves could liberate themselves. And 
Hegel thought this is a remarkable thing, the self-liberation of slaves. In other words, it, an angel didn't arrive and liberate them, and, a, and an enlightened individual didn't come along and liberate it. They liberated themselves. And Hegel thought very deeply about that. So it's, very, it's a beautiful thing that one of his students would be, and interpreters would be Martin Luther King. Coming back to Charles and Hetty, they had this, this serenity and confidence that that kind of grasp of the world brings. But with it comes danger, and he faced the danger, and Charles and Hetty faced the danger. But if you were in their presence, you didn't, they didn't communicate fear. So in other words, danger is right there with you in the room. But you, in order to achieve what you must achieve, you must have no fear. And you accept what happens. But the world is so much better for Hetty and Charles and, of course, Martin Luther King. And I'm glad I'm able to come here tonight and be part of this. Thank you. We shall overcome. Who is next? Who's going? And I see the dance communities in the house, percussion, drummer. I see Koba. I see dance immersion. I see all kinds of people. I mean, like two million people in here. It's really hard for me to recognize all of the people individually, but I'm doing good. Mm hmm. All right. We shall overcome. See that? What? That was your moment right there. For some reason, I thought like the next speaker, you noticed that my hand went there and boom, it said, we shall overcome. And you smiled and said, of course I'm coming up next and saying something. We shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. Though I join hands so often with students and others. I didn't get you. <laughs> How you doing? How you doing? Um, it's my, actually my first event here, coming here, right? So uh, I'm not much of a public speaker. And, but what I can say is I know I wasn't there, you know, in a march on, you know, back in those days. I was probably not even born yet. However, when I was speaking, when I was talking to our Sunset, sunset um, my thing is, I asked her the question, what do you think that the, all this means today in 2017? 2018, sorry. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> 2018, and I think that's the most important question to me, mm -hmm. right? And so, because I've noticed the kids nowadays do not have the connection to history as you do, right? And I think that's tragic because, as you know, there's sort of a psychological warfare being waged on our culture, right? And I think it's important to understand what the connection is between Martin Luther King and today. I think today, um, to me, the connection so far, to my understanding, is that because of uh, what Martin Luther King did, we have the luxury, right, of having this discussion, have the luxury of not even caring. Okay, we have the luxury just to be people, right? And so I think that we, the young people, have to be taught this history. But when we teach it to them, they, we have to make the connection to them how they, how they can apply those same nonviolent principles in 2018 in, in, in their life. So that's basically what I got to say. Right, but if to my question, right, I would throw that open to the floor. All right. Great. Thank you. 
thank you for sharing and reminding us um, about making the connections between history and today and the past and engaging young people. And I'm glad that you talked about the next generation. One of the things that we see oftentimes in our community are families, and then we see their progress. And one of the things that we noted over the years, too, was the progress of Hugo's family and what was happening with his daughters and what was happening with his children. And every step of the way, there would be bragging rights. Any good Trinidadian have bragging rights every 30 seconds. Oh, yeah, yes, see me now. Bragging rights, right? And he would come all the time and give us an update. Oh, gosh, you know, my daughter's doing this. They're running the world now. They went to Mount Everest. This one have a, you know, a cure for cancer and open heart surgery and everything. And, right, right, right. and then they would show up. And true, yes, they did Mount Everest, did open surgery and whatever. But in seriousness, we saw the progression. We saw that they became medical practitioners and we saw that they would travel the world, and they also took their parents to, to share in those experiences. I've said all that to say, Cassandra, we might not have seen you over the years and time, but your dad came and gave us all your updates of all the things that you were doing in the field of health sciences, and I know that he was proud of you, or you are as proud of him. I think I even watched the Border Patrol show where you were featured and maybe your dad was featured. That's a whole nother story in a whole nother town. And I know everybody's running home to look at the Border Patrol show. But <laughs> I digress. <laughs> Tell it, right? So Cassandra, come on up and rock this mic. All right. <laughs> Dr. Cassandra, Cassandra. All right. Thanks, Aita. Thanks, Sunset and Dawn, and thanks everyone for coming. My name is Cassandra Extivore. I'm Hugo's oldest daughter. I was so excited to be here, so pleased and moved and touched that the community was putting this together, right up until Aita said Border Patrol. Okay, okay, I can, I can move with this. So maybe I'll tell the Border Patrol story, <laughs> because it exemplifies a lot of things about my father and, you know, why I'm able to be here today. So I'm a scientist, I'm a geneticist, I run a research lab, I have to travel a lot for my work and go to conferences, which is PR for science. So, uh, you know, I definitely consider that the reason that I'm able to do what I do is because of the inspiration and the support that my father gave me. He was not an academic scientist, he was not a, you know, traditional man in any sense of the word, it, you know, in, in professional, in musical interests, uh, academic interests. Um, I did not exactly follow in his footsteps. If you say, I'm also a musician, what kind of music do I play? It is not the same as his. What kind of books do I read? It's not the same as his. But what I can say is that he unwaveringly encouraged me to do what it was I wanted to do and follow the path that I thought was interesting for me. And his only requirement was, are you doing your best? And are you enjoying it? And are you fulfilling the responsibilities that you have taken on? If you're doing those things, then do what you want to do. So I followed that inspiration, and he spoke, you know, he was really, in another incarnation, he would have been an academic, and he was always reading about things that he didn't know about, reading about places he'd never been, and one time I needed to go to a conference in New Zealand, and I said, Daddy, why don't you come with me? You've never seen this part of the world. The only reason I have the opportunity to go there is because of all the encouragement and support that you gave me that enabled me to pursue these studies and have this career, so I want you to share in that. So we went on a two-week trip to Australia and New Zealand, and we were in Australia first, and then going to New Zealand. And New Zealand is an island nation, like Trinidad, and um, like many island nations, they have a limited number of life forms, and most of them have been extinguished by humans. So they're very protective of their animals and their plants. And their border control is not a joke. That's why they have the whole show about border patrol. <laughs> so you cannot have an apple or a banana or a pumpkin seed or anything. They do not No wildlife, no biological material can enter their borders from outside. So they ask you to make a declaration. Do you have anything? I said no. And now my father, those of you who knew him, who saw him around the neighborhood, you know he loves gardening, he loves plants, he might often have flowers or leaves, 
don't think that he paid for those in a store. <laughs> he saw a bush at the side of the road and thought it was so nice. Okay. So we're in Australia, and he said, but Santa, I didn't know they had this. Look at this palm tree. Look at this plantain. Look at this, but I should buy some land here. I said, okay, well, sure. Why not? Why not? But they have banana. But, so he was so impressed with this part of the world. He had no idea could have tropical things like Trinidad. So he was stealing plants and bushes from the neighbors <laughs> all the time. So I said, Daddy, please don't. Okay, we can't bring that to New Zealand. He said, oh, but I just want to take it home and plant it. I said, no, you cannot cross the border with that. He said, okay, 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 okay. So we crossed the border, we're at the thing, customs says, do you have any plant or animal materials? I said, no, my father's not saying anything. He said, I'll just let you talk. Okay. So he said, no. He said, okay. So they scanned the bag. They said, what is something in the bag? We have to open your bag. I said, okay. I'm looking at my father. He's saying nothing. And they opened the bag, passion fruit, <laughs> lemon flower, this bush, I don't know what, these seeds from this. I look at him, he says, what? I said, Daddy, this is biological. Bin no, but it's just a couple of seeds and a small. I said, okay. And uh, I got written up in New Zealand customs law as having violated their law, and I guess this made a spectacular episode of Border Patrol <laughs> with me not looking amused at all. <laughs> all. And my father saying nothing. He was just like, and again, those of you who knew my father knew that it was very unusual for him to keep his mouth shut. But somehow he had no comments at that time, no comments. So, you know, inev you know, obviously we entered New Zealand, you know, nobody died. Uh, everything was okay, but that's the Border Patrol story. So it really tells a lot of things about my father. He loved to learn new things, to see new things, to see new places, to meet new people. He wanted to take it with him, literally, physically, take it with him. He didn't consider that, you know, the things of the earth belong to people. Okay, this is so-and-so's garden. I don't know them, but I can take that lemon. Okay, okay, well, that's a way of looking at the world, and I appreciate it, you know, in spirit, if not in practice. <laughs> um, he, um, again, had this great spirit of adventure, and of, uh, I know that he appreciated the chance to come with me, and, that, and his support and his feeling proud of me also helped that make that an absolutely memorable visit and when my father passed and I let my close friends know of what had happened, I'm not, uh, I keep my professional life and my personal life fairly separate, but all the scientists who I interacted with on that conference met my father and I let all of them know and all of them said, but I remember meeting him 10 years ago in New Zealand and he made such an impression on me and that's an amazing, um, that's an amazing thing. Um, one of my colleagues from graduate school, my father came to visit me in graduate school in Spain, and this guy, Antonio, I let him know as well, and he said, wow, I only met your father once when he came to visit you, and my first son had just been born, and I remember that he brought a little t-shirt for my son, and I thought, wow, this man I don't even know, but he thought of me and my family and brought me something, so, you know, I send your family my condolences, so, um, you know, I guess I, it's fine, go watch Border Patrol, I don't know how you find it. <laughs> I've never seen it, but, you know, I have to give thanks for my father for all the things that he taught me and all the things that he gave me that, you know, put us in that situation that I can share here with you. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Cassandra. It was the most watched show ever. Everybody called everybody, you got to watch it now. See, that's how I got onto it, right? <laughs> it's funny. All right, who's next? Charmaine, are you hiding behind uh <laughs> Suddenly you went out of my view. <laughs> yes, I, I couldn't see you anymore. All right. Who's next? Was you again? All right. <laughs> well, I figured Sunset had two turns. <laughs> so... so. So I didn't speak to Hugh Exteva, so I'd like to tell you two little short stories. Um, he was well known in Afro Pan, in Afro Steel Band, in the engine room playing the iron, you know. And I'm a member of Afro Pan too, and um, so I thought we'd like to um, shout him out on that. Yep. And the second little uh, mention I want to make about X, as we also call him affectionately, um, 
He started off his children's career in performing arts. I remember they were about 11, 12, 13, 14, thereabouts, and he rented a, 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 a hall on St. George Street, and he invited me to be the MC. And I was a part of launching your guys' career. And when I heard that you're a singer in Boston and, and stuff and stuff, I said, wow, I, 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 you know, I'm in good company. And um, he also used to tell me that Marcus uh, worked for Obama. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he had great, um, his children has done really well, and I wanted to shout him out on those two things. And I saw they brought his conga drum here. Wait, people over there in the balcony area, how you doing back there? You could, I see Jennifer Walcott. Very good, Jennifer. How you doing? Your heart's beating fast right now. You're coming up, you said. All right, then. I wasn't mistaken. You're waving. All right, it's a waving thing. And then one Black History Month, um, when I worked many moons ago in Fleming and Park, um, we invited a number of people to do presentations for African History Month to youth. And it was an after four program, and you can picture the gym, the, yeah, the gym packed to capacity. And an organization came to do a Black History Month presentation, and in about five minutes, the whole gym cleared. Everybody went to the bathroom, and because there was a rule at that time, if you went to the bathroom, you had to go with a friend. That meant that 100 people went to the bathroom, and 100 friends went to them. Lasted five minutes. Next week, we had another presenter. And they came, and they had some traction, and I think the students lasted half an hour. Half a hundred people went to the bathroom, and the other hundred people went to the friend. Third week was Hugh Extravore, and this is where I fell in love with him, and this is where I had a respect for his artistry. And once again, Hugh came. He came in his car. He got out, and he had on the plaid pants, the polka dots, the flowers, 100 earrings, lots of bracelets, and two big sacks. And all the youth in Fleming and Park Community Center looked through the window and thought, holy cow, who is that? And Hugh came in, and he had his two big sacks, and his performance began. Okay, everybody, I reach, uh-huh. Put down the bags, all right. Put the seats up. Okay, we're going to be drumming today. Bring the drum now. Okay, open the bag. Everybody take out a percussion. And then about 10 minutes later, about 35 youth, everybody had something to knock. Everybody had a drum. Everybody could use their mouth. Everybody could stamp their feet. Everybody had bottle and spoon. And this is how for almost an hour he spoke about Martin. He spoke about the politics in the city. And when you talk about the transference of information to our young people, that's how he did it. The whole time he never stopped. All the time drumming. 35 people keeping music and making music and knowing that they too are instruments. And at the end of the night, and the end of his performance, they packed all the things in the bag. He didn't pack them. They packed them. And then they took the bags and walked him to the car. The man wearing the polka dot pants, the flower thing, the striped, 200 earrings, all kinds of bracelets. But he had a percussion and something for everyone. That's how we transfer the information to young people. Hey! <laughs> okay, who's next? <laughs> Madeline Edwards is in the house coming all the way from Mississauga. Madeline is one of the founding sisters of the Congress of Black Women, um, also too responsible for building an incredible um, condominium building, uh, um, apartment building for newcomer women in Mississauga. Want to big her up and send her some love. Wei Lu, is this you? Oh, okay, fine. All right. So here it comes. We had sunset. Now we're going to have dawn. So bring it on up, dawn. Here we go. Woohoo! <laughs> Got no money in my pocket. Come on. Snap, snap. Nothing in my locket. Got no meat. Nothing to eat. But I got you and rice. Thank you. Um, I want to move our souls with the memories of Martin Luther King and the names of the 
great people who have been mentioned here, Hugo Extavor, Charles Roach, Hetty Roach, of, of Manifa, yes, of the people who have passed on, Stanley Grizel, um, Arch Bastien, he was one of the founding members of Jeribu. Jeribu, oh yes, Jeribu. And um, in order to move our souls, I feel we have to get up out of these seats for a moment. So are you willing to come with me on a journey to move our souls? Are you